So what are overheads and preliminaries? Well, the distinction is to change the name slightly. So instead of calling it overheads, if you refer to company overheads and you refer to project preliminaries, that gives you a very clear distinction. And overheads for a company, as the picture says, are generally um, office overheads, uh, administration. I'll come through to the specifics in a minute. Uh, but project preliminaries would be the running of the site and the plant involved in that. So a bit more detail, what are company overheads? Well, the list is endless and it can be whatever you want in your organisation, but typically it would be a board of directors, senior management, finance, stationery, business development. It's all of those costs in running the business that can't be attributed to a single profit centre or uh, a single aspect of the business, a product, say, for example. So looking at the structure of a typical manufacturing company, in this example, we've got a, a company with three products. It has its individual cost of sales. That's costs that are directly attributable to individual products. But over that, it has an overarching set of costs which can't be attributable. Those are the indirect costs of running the business. They are said to be the overheads. So those overheads are absorbed or spread equally over the products within that business. If we now turn that to a construction company, Com construction companies typically don't have products, but they do have projects. So in the same way that the project products work, the projects have their own individual costs, and above that are the company overheads that are to be absorbed equally across its range of projects. Now, if we break the, into the next layer of the onion and look at a construction project, again, the construction project has elements of cost. So this is a very typical, uh, very simple building. It's got drainage, a structural frame and a roof. So it's got measured works costs for each element. They're the direct cost of executing those elements. But above it, it has its overheads or project preliminaries. Now, those are the indirect costs that can't be attributed to a particular element and they are absorbed by the various um, elements in the project. So what are project preliminaries? Well, they kind of mirror um, company overheads. So you've got project manager. So it's basically the manager and technical supervisory um, resource, bonds, insurances, everything that can't be directly attributable to a um, specific element of the project. So how should we evaluate prelims? <clears throat> well, in the JCT context, uh, it's very unprescriptive. So you're able to value your tender however you choose. And typically, it's your best estimate of cost plus an allowance, a percentage for overheads and profit. And people would typically list out what their prelims are and price those as, as elements of cost. Variations are prescribed in the contract, usually on a measure and value basis, and claims um, would be the evaluation of a compensable event. And I'll come back to what that means, but that's in the JCT is a relevant matter. Um, so the JCT has a loss and expense clause, and that is generally based on actual cost or loss incurred. And I'll come back to explain that in, in a bit more detail. The NEC, it's a very prescriptive contract and people, I guess, will be fairly familiar with this. It, uh, it tells you how to put your tender together and how to price up your variations or what are now known as compensation events. And that's a combination of your defined costs uh, taken from your schedule of cost components and your fee percentages. Now, bear in mind that there is no loss and expense provision within the NEC. So everything has to be put caught within a compensation event which can be time barred. So it's very critical, it's very, very prospective and very prescriptive as you have as how you have to deal with this. So under the NEC, rather than making a claim for actual cost, what you're required to do is to make a, a forecast of your anticipated defined cost, which could also be a combination of your forecast or actual cost, depending on when the compensation event is being priced. Uh, there we go. So what is a typical loss and expense claim for preliminaries? Well, it depends, is the simple answer to that. 
And that's a bit of a lawyer's answer. And I guess if James was here, and maybe Kat will say the same, um, but most of their answers are depends because everything hinges on the case and the facts and the actual contract. People say they've got a JCT contract or an NEC contract. The truth is they haven't because I've never seen a construction project procured on an unamended contract. So you quite often find there are as many amendments as there are clauses in the standard contract. And certainly on the NEC, I see a lot of Z clauses. And that changes how the mechanics of the contract works. Therefore, it does depend on, on how your particular contract has been amended. Now, remember also that time does not always equal money. So there are two types of delay that we can look at. There's an excusable delay, which is covered by a relevant event in the JCT. And there is a compensable delay, which is covered by relevant matters. Now, just because you have an excusable delay, you don't necessarily have a compensable delay. So let's look at prolongation for, let's say, extremely bad weather. That one of the JCT would be a relevant event and classed as an excusable delay, whereas it's not a relevant matter. So it wouldn't be classed as a compensable delay. So in that instance, you would be entitled to an extension of time, but not entitled to any more money. However, if it was a variation or an, or an employer risk event, you would in fact be entitled to um, extra time as a relevant matter and also as a compensable delay, extra money as a relevant, uh, sorry, time as a relevant event and a compensable delay as a relevant matter. Now thickening, this is where prelims are increased to uh, absorb additional work on a project. Uh, there's a huge debate on this at the moment as to whether that should be valued at cost or at value. And we'll come on to that again, um, maybe on the next slide. Um, thickening is often seen as an additional cost and therefore could be viewed as an additional expense. Um, there, is, there is a moot, um, it's a moot point whether this should be valued as rates or costs, but we'll, we'll work through that on, on the next slide. So overhead and profit. Um, we talked before about overheads being absorbed. So your loss would be any unabsorbed overheads. So let's say you have your overheads absorbed over a period of 20 weeks in the original contract. Variations or events that have taken place mean that your contract is extended by 10 weeks. You've then got 10 weeks of unabsorbed overheads. So it's not a direct loss, but it is classed as a direct loss. So you are entitled to recover those unabsorbed overheads. And generally, once you've proven the fact, the theory that you have lost those overheads, the unabsorbed element, they can be calculated on a formula. Profits, profits can't be lost. What you actually lose is the opportunity to make a profit. So you can't, you can't lose something that you haven't got, but you can lose the opportunity to make a profit. That's quite difficult to prove that you've lost an opportunity, but you are entitled to make a claim if you are indeed able to prove that uh, theoretical loss. Now, termination. Um, if a contract is terminated and there are extended prelims, uh, going back to 1968, Judge McGall um, set, the, set the scene that uh, costs under termination were to be valued at the rates in the contract because that was what was deemed to be the loss of the contractor. But at that time, it was only agreed that that should apply in the case of termination. In all other instances, it was viewed as actual provable loss. But that has changed over time because people are now saying that what the contractor has actually lost is the rates in the contract. And this, this came out in the Lilly versus Mackay case in, in more recent years, where <coughs> Jake Head, uh, as he was then, uh, issued the obiter uh, remarks that um, the, the actual loss was the contract rate. So therefore, prelims in prolongation can be extended at the rates in the contract. Now, there's a bit of a drawback there because very often these days, there are no contract rates for prelims. In that instance, you would need to revert to actual provable costs. Now, there's a bit of a win-win here for contractors because if you can't make your 
rates, the contract rates stack up, i.e. if you're losing money at your contract rates, under the JCT, you are able to claim your actual costs. So it's loss and or expense. And that would be under the heading of expense. Um, there we go. Proximity, remoteness and foreseeability. Um, these are legal terms, really. Um, the old case of Hadley versus Baxendale, um, that set the, the benchmark for what were consequential losses and what were direct losses. And the basic principle is that you can't claim for consequential losses. And this involved a mill owner who procured the services of a delivery driver to, to deliver a replacement part to his mill. The delivery driver promised to deliver the, the replacement part the next day, but in fact, he delivered it five days later. So the mill owner tried to claim four days loss of productivity uh, as a claim uh, against. So that was hardly making the claim against Baxendale. It was held at the time that the claim was unsuccessful because these were consequential losses and they were not foreseen by Baxendale at the time. So when he accepted the delivery and he said and he promised to deliver the part the next day, he couldn't have foreseen that if he delivered the part late, he would have faced um, fairly large uh, damages. So his his uh, the loss of Hadley didn't naturally flow from the breach because it was too far from it. It was not foreseen by Baxendale. Now contrast that with um, still a while ago, but a bit more recent, um, Crudas versus Corwoods. Corwoods supplied concrete products to the site and they had an exclusion clause in their terms which said they weren't liable for any consequential losses arising from late delivery. However, it was held in the Court of Appeal that their late delivery could not be classed as a consequential loss. Because they supplied regularly to the construction industry, they would have known, they would have therefore foreseen that if they deliver products late, they would actually incur, the, the contractor would actually incur the direct costs of standing time for men, resources and plant. So it was wrong for them to class them as consequential losses. In that instance, they would be classed as direct losses and Crudas was successful with its claim. So now we talk about the burden of proof. So when you put a claim together, remind yourself of C's. That's cause, effect, entitlement, and substantiation. So you need to have a causal event. You need to be able to link that event to an effect. You need to establish entitlement, which comes from getting your notices in on time, which James will cover later. And you also need to comply with the contractual requirements. So assume that you've got all those three boxes ticked, you then need to be able to evidence your claim. You need to be able to substantiate what you're claiming for. And for that, you need records, contemporaneous records to back up what you're contending was, your, um, was the impact of the breach. You need to be careful not to do any double dipping. That means any, any prelims that have been claimed in variations at the time of the delay can't also be claimed in the delay. So those, those prelims need to be identified and taken out at some point. You have an obligation to mitigate, but not accelerate the works. So there is a rule against the recovery for avoidable consequences. So if there are any avoidable consequences, you do have an obligation to mitigate and keep those costs as low as possible. The criminal burden of proof doesn't apply to us, which is fortunate because you would be required to provide effectively a smoking gun. We're, we're governed by the civil burden, which is on the balance of probabilities, or what I like to call more likely than not. So you're evidence, your proof, needs to only reach the bar of 51%. Once you've got to 51%, it is more likely than not that what you're contending is actually correct. So let's work through uh, a worked example. We've got a simple delay analysis here. We've, we've broken the project down into four periods. We've, got a, we've identified the critical path was impacted by 94 days across those four periods. In column B, we've identified that at the start of the job, there were 10 days of float. So we've taken the float out and we've got to column C and we've identified the net critical delay to the project, which is 84 days. 
We then look at each delay period and we can see that on the column D, the contractor was actually culpable for 22 delays delay. Those are de delays that he is responsible for and not the, not the employer. There was also 12 days of concurrency. And then we get to column F, which is the EOT entitlement. So this is the um, entitlement to additional time. So we take column C, which is the net critical delay of 84 days. We take off the contractor culpable days of 22, and we add back the concurrency to get to 74 days of additional time. So that's the extension of time against the 94 day original delay period. Then looking at the loss and expense entitlement, we take the extension of time of 74 days, and then we take off the concurrency because there were two competing delaying events at that point, and we get to 62 days of um, compensable delay. So how do we value those 62 days? Well, we look at the, the, this is prolongation that we're looking at now. So for each delay period, this is delay period one, you've identified all of the costs in there, and uh, that extends onto the next slide to, to arrive at a total. So we look at delay, uh, period one, the total cost is £20,150 based on um, either the rates in the contract or the actual costs if they're greater than the rates in the contract. What do we do with that figure? Well, we then put that into this calculation. So we identify for each of the delay periods an actual delay cost. Then we apply the loss and expense entitlement in those delay periods from the delay analysis that we looked at earlier. And we see that in period three and period four, there is a total of 62 days uh, compensable delay. We work out an average daily cost for each of those periods, and that produces a total in this instance of 95,000 pounds. Then we have to consider double dipping. So there's an abatement for the recovery of costs so this is prelims recovered in the day works and variations during the same delay periods number three and four. They amount to £24,500. So that produces a net prolongation claim of £72,992 in this instance. So my final slide is key takeaways. We said before it depends. So you need to understand and apply your contract and how your contract has been amended. We need to prove what you're claiming. So maintain contemporaneous ev uh, records, evidence your events, evidence your costs. We need to consider all of the impacts and events and the knock-on effect that might affect later works. He who asserts must prove, so the onus is on you to prove what it is that you're contending. And think of C's, cause, event, cause, effect, entitlement, and substantiation. And finally, really important to analyze the delay and then match the costs claimed to the timing of the delay. And that ends the end of my presentation. Thank you for listening. Great, thank you very much, Bill. Um, so uh, we are, okay, yeah, we've got a question come in so we'll, we'll save the question for the end i'm going to introduce to you now our next speaker um great um so the next speaker is james driver now james has had a few little technical issues so we're going to i what i propose to do james hopefully you can still hear me and we can hear you is i yeah. will advance to the next slide yeah that's good so um I'll advance to the next slide. If you just give us a shout when you want your next slide to come up, and we will um, we will go ahead on that basis. So James is a partner and manages the construction team at Clark Wilmot Law Firm. Um, basically, we have offices throughout the UK. Has a particular niche in working with Spanish contractors. They've been working on the um, large uh, power station at Carrington, just outside Manchester. Um, works for a number of other Spanish contractors, but um, has a wide range of experience in various disputes and construction cases over the years. And uh, he's going to talk to you now on the subject of variations and notices. So, James, we shall flick to the next slide, and away you go. Thank you very much, Stuart. 
Um, yeah, I was just going to start building really on what Bill's just said about the importance of understanding your contract. Um, as most, if not all of you, will probably be aware, under the Construction Act, Section 115, the parties are free to agree on the manner of service of any notice or other document under their contract. Um, if you don't agree it, then it's any effective means. So we quite often get asked by clients when they're looking at serving what they consider to be an important notice under the contract, how do I do it? And the starting point is always your contract. The, the courts and the, and the statute is very clear on that. It will give you the freedom to agree whatever you want and it really can be as extreme and specific as you make it. Um, we'll come on to that in a moment. But that's your starting point. What does your contract say? And it's really worth, at the start of any project, understanding what your contract says. And, and the key bits that you need to look at aren't really that onerous. It's invariably a question of risk um, that you need to understand. And, and the notice provisions under your contract should jump out at you. So you need to understand what they are, and the key bit is you need to understand what form does any notice need to take, and what are the timings of it, and we'll come on to that in a moment. But the other kind of commercial point you just wanted to make at the start is we well understand that this is a balance. When you're sending these notices to your clients or to your supply chain, it's a balance because you don't want to look too contractual and too claims focused so that you appear problematic for your clients because you'll very quickly run out of clients if you get that reputation. But I can tell you having sat um, at the table with every member of the supply chain that employers will look at any contractors who are sending them notices couched in the right terms um, perfectly properly. They will see you as understanding your contractual position and being a sophisticated contractor. Uh, and you do not need to, to be worried about upsetting your clients and supply chain, provided you strike that balance. Um, I think that's very, very important. So what I was going to do is just run through um, a few cases, um, building up really to explaining how important it is to understand what the notice provisions are in the contract, and in particular the timings. Because even if you have a watertight case, in terms of an entitlement to delay, for example, and loss of expense. If you miss the strict contractual requirements in terms of notifying, you can be precluded from bringing that claim, however harsh that might seem. So we have um, another case here, our the Walden Estates and Cost Day Management from 92, where instructions were issued to the contractor in respect of remedial work following the collapse of a building wall. Now, interestingly, these instructions did not constitute variations because the parties had agreed that the contractor was liable for the collapse. Now, I suspect that's common sense for most of you. The idea being that where you have additional instructions that are necessitated because of the factors for which the contractor was liable, unsurprisingly, you won't just get compensation. If it was your fault, it was your fault. So the next, um, next slide, please, Stuart. This is a uh, Scottish case, AMEC, uh, and a Scottish coal company. So I won't, I won't dwell on it because it is Scottish. But the important and interesting point to note on it is that in order to protect your position, you have to ensure that all instructions are formal variations and comply with the requirements set out in the contract. Now, interestingly, on that case, the employer didn't actually expressly consent to work that was done. And even though the contractor had done the work, it wasn't considered to constitute a variation to the contract entitling the contractor to additional time and money. So again, it's the point. You have to just be clear on what your contractual position is. And please do not be averse to sending notices because you think, oh, it's obvious, or this will come out in the wash in due course. Th that is such a risky move, which we see all the time. Check your contract. Understand what your position is. Put the requisite notice in rather than thinking it'll be all right later. Um, Williams Fitzmaurice, very old case from 1858. Sorry, Stuart, this is the next slide. Um, where, putting it simply, a contractor agreed to build a house, and the specification did not expressly mention floors. So the contractor wasn't entitled to a variation to build the floor, and consequently wasn't entitled to additional time and money. This was a case where the scope of works was very broadly defined. And again, it illustrates the importance of understanding what the contract says you've got to do, 
and making sure that you preempt any issues by putting notices in and getting agreement to works beforehand rather than just assuming everything will be all right later. The next slide, English industrial estates and Kia construction. This just confirms what I think most of us um, understand, which is that a contractor is free to choose a particular method by which to complete the works. And the employer imposes, if the employer imposes a particular method and contractor by issuing instruction, this will constitute a variation. Where we've seen this recently, in a related point, slightly off point, but it's related, um, is on suspension. We've seen a cultural shift in the market where I would say a couple of years ago, you never saw anybody serve a termination notice on the basis of a failure to progress regularly and diligently with the works because it's such a risky move for an employer or a contractor to take against its supplier. Um, but we're seeing that that is happening now. Perhaps it's in part due to the fact that people are worried about people's financial viability and they want to try and get ahead of that and boot people off site. But what we've seen people try and argue is that the work hasn't been progressing regularly and diligently because people haven't been following the, following the agreed sequence of works. Now, th this point here is, is very important, I think. More often than not, the contractor will be free to determine what sequence of works they're going to adopt and will be free to tweak that in the event that there are any problems on site. And what we're all experiencing at the moment may well be very relevant. If for whatever reason that contractor tries to mitigate any delays by resequencing the works, more often than not, that will be within the contractor's gift. So employers need to be very careful about issuing instructions um, to the contrary. On the next slide, this is really what I wanted to focus on, condition precedent. Now, um, most if not all of you will be familiar with uh, the phrase condition precedent. Now, interestingly, what it basically means is you need to have, uh, or rather, if you have a clause in your contract that says that the person who wants to make a claim needs to notify in a particular way and within a particular period, then if, if they don't do that, that can then be a bar to bringing an otherwise um, legitimate claim. Very, very important to understand it. And I think the important thing to stress at the start is you do not need to have the actual words condition precedent in your contract. So it isn't just a case of quickly scanning your contract to see if those words appear. It's a bit more sophisticated than that. And in Bremer and Vanden, 1870, sorry, 1978, it was decided that for a notice requirement to be a condition precedent, it should, one, state the precise time within which the notice must be served, and two, make clear that unless the notice is served within that specified time, the claiming party will lose its right to claim. So just to summarize what we just said, state the period within which you have to give your notice and make it clear that if you don't do that, you'll lose the right. Now, interestingly, that was developed slightly in 2007 in Steer and Sigma, where it was found that a clause which required the subcontractor to give, quote, within a reasonable period written notice to the contractor. So that's not quite as specific a period as Bremer. That could be a condition precedent despite not meeting that first requirement. Um, next slide. Walter Lillian Mackay, um, Bill mentioned this case. I think it's, uh, it's accepted in the, in the profession that if in doubt, check Walter Lillian Mackay because he seemed to cover absolutely every legal principle. Um, the case considered the notification requirement in relation to loss and expense it was, uh, in relation to JCT. Court accepted that a timely application was a condition precedent of the contractor's entitlement. And the court further noted that the application could be made prospectively. This is an important point, which is before the loss or expense has been incurred, or retrospectively, after it's been incurred. So what does that mean? Prospectively and retrospectively, Bill touched on this. Um, prospectively, you're looking ahead. You can see that something's happened which might cause delay and might incur uh, additional loss and expense. Or retrospectively, you're looking back after it had been occurred and you can see what's happened. Now, that can be very, very important when you're looking at condition precedents because you can imagine if you've got a very strict time limit for notifying a claim, that difference between the time when you might first have been alerted to the possibility of a delay and 
the period when actually it's all happened and you can now retrospectively see what's happened could be quite a big difference and it could also be absolutely key to whether or not you're still within time in accordance with that condition precedent. And that point was made in OHL and Gibraltar. This was a claim where OHL, big Spanish contractor, were basically building, uh, I think it was a tunnel under the, uh, uh, under the airport. Um, and there was, there was a strict condition precedent in that. Uh, and I think it was Aikenhead judge, but he decided that the, um, the period for the giving of notice for a claim for an extension of time could start to run either when it was clear that a delay to completion will occur, so um, prospective, or when the delay has actually started to be incurred, retrospective. And that was very, very important. And it was clear from the, from the judgment that the court understood that this was a very draconian clause, and therefore it ought to be interpreted as broadly as possible, perhaps, to help the contractors, because otherwise, a legitimate claim may well be time barred. So um, that, that kind of brings it to a conclusion, really, from my point of view. And I, and I can't stress enough how important it is to check those notices at the start. And um, we completely understand that when you, when you get these contracts in from clients and certain contractors who are well known for it, it can be as big as war and peace, some of these standard form contracts. But I think when you get used to dealing with these kind of issues and you start thinking about them, it's actually surprisingly easy to flick to those key clauses. It's invariably about price and risk for you guys. And though finding those clauses, like condition precedents, understanding what the notice provisions are, um, they're, they're, they're pretty, pretty easy to identify once you get used to it. So that's always your starting point. What does your contract say? And I think you need to make sure that your teams and anyone who's operating these contracts have taken the time to understand that before they dive in and start, start the work. That was me, Don Stewart. Thank you very much. OK, so thanks, James. Um, and thanks also, I mean, I just make this point at this point that, that um, thanks to all the speakers, we kind of switched this at the very last minute, kind of last week, when we realized that this definitely wasn't going to be possible and thought, actually, we could perhaps do this as a webinar. So thank you very much to all the speakers for changing the format and changing their, their uh, the way that we do this. We've never done a webinar um, as Decipher before, so this is a whole new world for us, but it seems to be going reasonably smoothly so far. So. Um, so on to our last speaker. The last speaker this morning is um, Catherine Percy, who is a barrister at Hardwick, one of the uh, big construction and commercial sets down in London. Um, so Cat Percy is, um, and the great thing about barristers, there's always lots of quotations that you can use. And I found a few. So simply exceptional, very bright, understands complicated technical issues and very good at cross-examination. Um, impressive bright, hardworking, responsive, her experience and abilities are beyond her year of call. Um, so we're very grateful to Kat, who's, um, again, given up her time, managed to get online, find a laptop, find all the facilities that she needs to join us this morning. She's going to talk about delay analysis. Now, this is something that we've had at our seminars in the past, and it's kind of talk that comes up occasionally. Um, it's always of interest to people, but this is a different one because this is the barrister's perspective and the, the, the legal perspective rather than we've had Tom Francis and others talking about how to do it and how the best way to, to analyze delay. But um, Kat's going to have a chat about how the barrister's perspective on delay analysis. So Kat, over to you. Many thanks, Stuart, and good morning, everybody. Um, thank you for all the accolades that you've embarrassingly <laughs> quoted from our website. Um, I obviously didn't write most of them. Um, yes, I'm going to talk to you today about my perspective on delay analysis. So it is um, obviously subjective. And what I'm going to do is start with um, two uh, topics which are common that come up um, regularly in terms of whose delay analysis is right once you get to the stage of appointing experts to have a look at um, the best way of uh, presenting your client's case. And then I'm going to come on to um, Kat's five steps to a pers persuasive analysis. In other words, um, how do you make your analysis the winning one, um, either when you're assisting your expert if you're the client or if you're the expert trying to produce the analysis which is going to be most persuasive to a judge. 
Um, so I'm going to start with a topic that's um, already been touched on by um, James and by Bill, which is looking at the difference between retrospective and prospective analysis. And in the current political climate, um, I'm not really sure which one's best, but um, looking back doesn't seem all that great and looking forward is not being that positive either. So does it matter? Uh, some basic definitions, which I think James has already helpfully given, prospective analysis is where you try and put yourself in the shoes of the parties um, at the time various play events were occurring to try and work out what was happening on the ground at the time in terms of seeing what events might cause delay and um, the uh, periods for delay that might have been caused. Whereas a re retrospective analysis is basically the application of hindsight. Uh, you finish the job, you step back and you have a look and see well what delays were actually caused on the project rather than what was being predicted as the project went along. Um, now rather unhelpfully, and I hope this isn't a typical lawyer's answer, um, there isn't a clear um, message from the courts as to which sort of analysis they prefer. And of course that's great for lawyers because it always gives us something to argue about, but it makes um, it more difficult for clients and experts uh, to decide which way to approach this. And I'm going to give you three examples of cases where the courts have considered this competing battle between using a retrospective analysis or using prospective. Um, so the first case is one that's already been mentioned by both James and Bill. So it's obviously of some importance to everybody's um, uh, presentations today. And that's Walter Lilly and Mackay, a case going back to 2012. Um, and the judgment of Mr Justice Aikenhead. Uh, this case concerned a JCT contract, one of the older 1998 editions, and the works concerned the construction of three um, houses. The dispute concerned uh, one of those houses, which the employer was going to live in with his wife. Um, and uh, if you ever want to read about how difficult uh, employers can be in terms of a project going along, this is a really good example uh, where Mr Justice Aikenhead was quite scathing of um, uh, the client in this case in terms of the design changes that were being made as the work progressed. Um, the, client, so the contractor in this case um, claimed an extension of time um, from uh, all the way up to PC. Um, for re by reason of all various changes, but the design occurred as the project was ongoing, ultimately found that the contractor was right. But when it came to analysing what the right method of delay analysis was, the court was trying to decide, well, should it stand in the shoes of the contractor looking at the delay events as they occurred, or should the analysis be carried out? And the court recognised um, in this case, that the prospective analysis does have to be carried out as the works go along. That's what the JCT terms provide. But the JCT terms also provide that um, within a certain period after PC, the contract admi administrator then has to um, essentially do a check of that extension of time um, allowance to make sure uh, it's a fair and reasonable assessment of the delay. Um, now, what the contract administrator can't do is reduce the extension of time, uh, but the uh, contract administrator could increase the extension of time in certain circumstances and the court said well in those circumstances we're standing in the shoes of a contract administrator carrying out that exercise and so we've got to look at not only what was critically delaying the project as it went along um, but to look at what the contractor said was delaying the works um, at the material times during the course of the project uh, so it did carry out a retrospective analysis, but it combined it with a prospective analysis. So in this case, it did a bit of both. Um, and I think when I come back to my five steps at the end, uh, my five steps to success, uh, that's something to bear in mind that the court adopted one approach, but then used the other approach as a sort of checking analysis um, of uh, or a checking um, basis of the analysis that had been carried out. And now this reference to um, a sanity check that I put in the slides largely comes out of the judge's decision to prefer one of the experts' evidence over. And the expert during his cross examination said, Well, whatever approach the judge decides, I've done it one way, but I have sort of sanity checked it against um, the alternative approach. And I would recommend that to anyone carrying out um, delay analysis 
as something to do, then you don't fall into the trap of having to decide on one approach only, but you can explain why your approach either works both ways um, or why the analysis you've put together is should be preferred in a different way. Uh, the next case is um, Northern Ireland Housing Executive and Healthy Buildings and there was a lot of excitement when it came out because it's one of the first cases or only cases that properly considers whether or not the contract terms in an NEC contract uh, provide for a prospective or retrospective delay analysis. And I've put some of the relevant contract terms uh, um, on that slide and then I've set out what the judge uh, concluded uh, which was why should he shut his eyes and grope in the dark when the material was available to show what work they actually did and how much it cost them. Now that conclusion seems quite surprising if you look at some of the highlighted contract terms where the NEC provides for um, a forecast of the uh, time charge for work not done and for risk allowances and even says that once a compensation event has been um, uh, calculated in terms of time and money, uh, then even if later recorded information shows it to have been wrong, it can't be changed. So the language of NEC suggests that it's a prospective, forward-looking um, analysis that's got to be carried out. You do it as the job goes along. But the court then said, well, no, I'm, why should I close my eyes to the actual costs? And that re result seems quite surprising. Um, until you look at the facts where um, the parties hadn't actually followed the contract. And so when the contractor had put in his assessment of additional time and expense, um, he had done so based on his actual costs. And so then the contractor was left with saying, well, you should just base this on what I was saying, what the costs, and not look at the actual records. And the court said, well, in circumstances where the parties haven't actually followed the contract, you were straining the language of the contract to say that the process before the court was one that should be uh, defined by what those contract terms say. So whilst it is an um, important case in construing the NEC clauses to assess whether or not uh, a compensation event has occurred which gives rise to extra time and money, um, actually the parties in this case didn't use those contract terms and I think that means it will be quite an easy case to distinguish uh, in the future if you do have, which is rare in my experience, but you do have somebody who's properly exercised the process in the contract. And the last case I wanted to look at is Fleur and Shanghai, uh, where there's sort of a throwaway comment, uh, in my opinion, by Mr Justice Edward Stewart to say that a prospective analysis is the correct approach when considering matters such as the award of an extension of time. And there's lots of commentary on this case saying this uh, represents a change from what has been uh, decided in the past in terms of whether or not a retrospective or prospective analysis is appropriate. Um, and what I would say in relation to this case is whilst it obviously does say a prospective analysis is the right approach, it, this case wasn't concerned with looking at particular contract terms to determine whether or not an extension of time was warranted. Um, and it was really in my but a statement for the issues that the court had to decide uh, because this was a delay claim between a subcontractor and its supplier where um, in complicated facts there had been various waivers agreed between and the supplier as to certain delay causing events um, and the subcontractor was trying to recover monies it had used it had paid in a settlement with its main contractor and so while this does give some support for anybody who needs it for carrying out a prospective approach, um, I would use it quite carefully because it wasn't actually doing a detailed consideration as to what is the right approach in every case for a delay analysis. So that's what I have to say on prospective and retrospective. Um, in summary, the appropriate approach, sort of drawing things together from the case law will depend on what the terms of the contract say, whether or not the contract has been followed, we saw that from the Northern Ireland case. What's being asked for, as um, Bill touched on earlier, is it just time? Is it time and money? Um, is it damages? And how does that affect the right analysis? Because different contract terms may give you um, a better approach to getting money, which is usually what the contractor wants. Uh, and that means that you might have to have followed a slightly different pro process. 
um, looking at the quality of your records, a judge is only human and if, like in the Northern Ireland case, somebody puts some material before the judge that says, well, I know they said that it was a 12 week delay, uh, but here's uh, five pieces of contemporaneous emails which show that actually what was driving the uh, project at that time was something completely different and that 12 week delay didn't cause any period of delay at all or those works were done more quickly than the contractor expected. Um, so the quality of the records will be, coming, will be important and something I'll come back to in my five steps to success. Uh, the next is how similar are the outcomes as we saw in the Walter Lilly case where an expert's able to say well I've done a prospective analysis or I've done a retrospective analysis but I've then sanity checked it using the alternative analysis that's going to be quite persuasive to a judge and certainly more persuasive than just saying one is appropriate when that's not the outcome so far from the case law. And um, the last, which is difficult for an expert to assess when they're putting um, their report together, but certainly something a client can check. How credible is the expert's analysis? Have you done your own um, testing on it to make sure the way they've looked at various events is reflective of what happened? Um, so that you can say, well, whichever way you um, approach it, I've done a, a sensible, credible, thorough um, delay analysis to give rise to my opinion. In relation to the difference between recognised methods and novel approaches, um, I'm only going to speak very briefly about this because um, it's not for me to go through all these recognised methods and tell you um, how they all work. I'm sure many of you know that better than me. But there are recognised methods contained in um, various texts, so Pig Advances text, but also in the Delay and Disruption Protocol, which usually, usually provide a good starting point for a delay analysis. Which one you choose um, then has to be justifiable as to why it's the appropriate one in a particular case. But even using a recognised method, just be aware, isn't necessarily going to get you home. And I've put the case of Yard and SD services on the slide, uh, which in which the court held that the SEL protocol is not a contract document, it's not commonly used in the construction industry, and so they're not going to necessarily as proof the procedure that you've decided to adopt is the right one. Um, but there are two Australian cases which show that where a recognised method is used over um, a novel approach, which hasn't been used in the industry before, um, that might give rise to that expert's um, approach being preferred because they've used a sort of tried and tested method uh, that's one that's recognised in the industry. Um, so that's not to say you can't use a novel approach, but if you are going to try using something different to what's been done before, uh, my suggestion is that you need to have good grounds for saying why you're do doing this novel approach uh, because um, even in, uh, for example, Alston where a first principles approach was said to have been used by the um, expert in that case, the court uh, rejected it. Now, I suspect it's more because of the underlying analysis that was carried out, uh, but um, if you can use the recognised method in accordance with the terms of the contract, um, that seems to be a better way of approaching a delay analysis than trying to do something um, out of the box. So I'm sure the bit you've all been waiting for, uh, my five tips to success, in other words, how to win. Uh, so with all these difficult um, uh, provi contra contract provisions and various uh, factors around you, how do you come out on top? Well, despite what happened in the Northern Ireland executive case, it is imp important to start with what does the contract provide. Um, different contracts obviously have different methods for um, notifying extensions of time, that's something that's been touched on by James, and for quantifying extensions of time. And you also need to keep an eye on when you're saying you've got a relevant, a relevant, relevant event, for example under a JCT, is that event also going to be something that gets you money? Um, or would you be better categorising it slightly differently if you can, so that it's both an entitlement to an extension of time and an entitlement to money? Um, I've summarised the JCT and NEC positions on the slide. Um, and of course, that's all subject to the way the courts then decide to interpret them. But I think if you've got a JCT um, uh, case, using Walter Lilly as a starting point isn't going to set you off on the wrong foot because it allows you to do 
both a prospective um, analysis whilst the courts are ongoing, sorry, whilst the works are ongoing, but then also a check um, at the end to make sure that the um, analysis that you've put together is right. Um, NEC is slightly more complicated because if you'd asked me for my um, legal opinion, obviously on Chatham House rules, uh, I would say this is a prospective approach to be adopted mm. under the NEC contract where the right procedure has been followed. But if you need to do a retrospective approach and the contract hasn't been followed, you'll get some support from the Northern Ireland Healthy Buildings case, which I referred to earlier. And um, also don't forget the special provision. So um, North Midland Building had uh, amended the JCT terms to deal specifically with how concurrent delay was to be resolved. And uh, in those circumstances, the court said, well, the parties have come to a specific agreement about concurrent delay. And um, it disallowed the extension of time that was being allowed for in reliance on the contract terms. So the contract is the key starting point. And if an expert doesn't start with what the contract says, um, then they're in for some pretty tough cross-examination, if you ask me. And uh, don't just then ignore the contract that might be relevant to proving en entitlements to extensions of time. James has already dealt with notice requirements, but there are also some contracts, usually the bespoke contracts between subcontractors and their supply chain, uh, which provide for record keeping requirements. Um, if if you have to have contemporaneous records showing your entitlement to an extension of time, then they need to be there. Now, in Kat's ideal world, when I start with my shopping list on cases of things I'd like to see, I often ask for the contemporaneous records, which I'll come on to shortly. Um, but if there are contractual requirements, it's really important that that's recognised by both the, both the client and the expert when coming to produce a delay analysis. Step two is good record keeping, as I've just alluded to. Um, the courts recognise that delay analysis is only ever going to be as good as the data that's put in. And so if you're a client who's insisting that something happened when there's no evidence that it did, then you need to make that good in your own witness evidence. And if the other side have got some contemporaneous documents which dispute that, the courts tend to look at those contemporaneous documents more favourably than somebody's recollection a year, two years, three years after the event. Um, so what sort of records are we talking about? Well, pre-contract and post-contract programmes are, are incredibly helpful when it comes to a delay analysis um, insofar as they're reliable. Progress reports, site photographs, the judge loves a picture. So if you've got pictures showing what was going on at what time, uh, they can be invaluable. Email correspondence and meeting minutes. And um, as James was saying earlier, sending notices or keeping records, if you do it from the get go before a problem starts, um, actually, it then doesn't look so surprising mm -hmm. if you start serving notices or start producing meeting minutes that contain the material that you might need further down the line to justify or verify what you're going to say in terms of an entitlement to an extension of time. Um, whereas if you only start doing when things start going wrong, I can understand the commercial strain that that might then place on your relationships with your um, fellow contractors or um, up the chain and down the chain, uh, because it looks like you're then starting to paper the file in readiness for a dispute. So my advice, it doesn't often get listened to, but my advice is um, if you can make records from the get go and um, they will really stand you in good stead. If you don't need them, you've not lost anything. If you do, you've got good evidence to provide to your expert to really substantiate his delay analysis. Step three, notices. Um, James has already um, uh, spoken to you about this, but have the right notices been served at the right time? If so, how does the contract treat them? If not, what impact does this have on the analysis? Does it prevent you bringing a claim at all because they were a condition precedent? Um, or does it not matter because like in the Northern, uh, Northern Ireland case, everything happened after the event, but no point really was taken about that. And even if the notices aren't um, specifically needed to uh, give rise to your entitlement to a delay uh, to an extension of time, what do they say and what was the other party's response? Which is really interested in what was being said contemporaneously. And therefore, how do those the parties' positions feature in the experts' report? Because if they're just disregarded, or I've seen no evidence for this, but there's an email, and um, that really undermines what the expert's saying. Step four: recognise the limitations of the report. 
Um, there's never going to be a complete world of information that the expert can use uh, so that uh, there was always going to be gaps. And uh, the courts also recognise that delay analysis inevitably includes a subjective element. Uh, so recognise what that is, try and differentiate which parts of the report are fact, which are opinion, if you can identify the sources of your various information, that's always helpful because a photograph is a much better source, for example, than a witness account perhaps given three years after the event. So identify the gaps, identify the assumptions, those are also important, and identify the limitations on the process that you've adopted because it will enable a judge to see that you're giving a credible report and doing the best you can on the information you've got and the limitations that you're subject to. And uh, last step, don't be selective. Um, I often start um, looking at expert reports, trying to find the section on the pleadings. If doing a report by, at the time you get to uh, litigation stage, so rather than advising your client, but coming into this when a client has already started proceedings or is asking you to help with those proceedings, there should always be a section in your report that deals with what the pleaded allegations are. Um, and somebody once told me when I was first starting out that um, litigation isn't an, a, a public inquiry as to precisely what happened on a project. It's trying to decide whose assertions in their pleaded documents are right. So what is it that the claimant's saying caused delay, usually the contractor, and what's the employer's response? Don't be selective and only look at what it is that your client's saying and then exclude the various arguments that are put forward by the other side. And explain the discrepancy. If you don't, if you are selective and you only take your client's case and explain why it's right, it has a case on the slide there in support of that where an expert didn't consider a particular scenario and it undermined his whole approach. So those are my five top tips uh, to um, producing a successful analysis. And the real summary is just be credible. Um, explain to the to the court, because that's who you're there to assist, what you've done, what you haven't been able to do, why you've done what you've done, and perhaps in an ideal world, what you would have liked to have seen to support various parts of your um, analysis. And again, don't treat it as a public inquiry. Your job is to provide an opinion on the cases put forward by the claimant and the defendant. Um, your case isn't, your job isn't to explore every possible avenue or every possible cause of delay to explain uh, why either one party's right or one party's wrong. You just need to deal with the pleaded issues. So those are my five top tips on how to produce a successful delay analysis. I appreciate some of it will be teaching you to suck eggs, but as they happen, uh, as the issues I've raised happen time and time again, um, I hope some of them are a useful reminder. And that's me, Stuart. Thank you very much, Kat. So that's Kat. Um, so we're going to move on to the questions and answers. We've got some questions already. If if there's anybody, um, we've, we've still got. We've managed to retain everybody on the on the line, so that's good. So thank you all for for sitting through all the talks, and uh, it seems to have gone very well. Um, yeah. I've just been told I'm echoing, so um, I'm turning my volume down. Um, the next part of the talk, so um, we're going to bring the Q&A up. So if there is anybody who has any more questions to ask, do just pop them in the, the box down at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Um, we'll run through the, the four or five questions that have come up now. Just while I'm doing that, um, it, it, um, Walter, Lily, and Mackay has come up a few times. If you haven't already, if there's anybody on, on that hasn't already had a look at that case, do have a look at it. Um, even if you don't read the detailed um, case reports and all the legal analysis of it there's a great piece on the daily mail which gives you all the salacious bits <laughs> where um, mr mr Mackay said to walter lily guess what when i've forgotten about you in a year's time uh, enjoying my 100 million pound home or sailing in one of my 40 meter yachts you'll still be trying to wind up some other poor unsuspecting customer a sad loser gaining your kicks and being irritating. Mr. Mackay wasn't the nicest of people, and uh, certainly not the nicest client. So uh, let's go on to questions and answers. So if I'm lucky, we might be able to get the first question up. There we go. Um, so 
can you advise what should be included in a notice that sufficiently covers COVID-19, um, particularly topical at the moment? I'm very conscious I've been on camera and keep touching my face. Um, how does <laughs> contract claims entitlement, what provisions under the contract exist? So um, perhaps one for the lawyers, um, Kat or um, James, if you're still here. Uh, yeah, hi, I'm still here. Just been, uh, just been joined by, uh, by a puppy, though, so I might, might be a few distractions in the background. Just one sec. Um, yeah, it, it's, well, Kat can perhaps um, uh, have an answer to it as well. From my point of view, it's, it's obviously a topical issue at the minute, and there's some real uncertainty over what, what, what you treat COVID as. The obvious thing is um, force majeure, but that's going um, to depend largely on what contract you're on, unsurprisingly, to start with, because force majeure uh, requires a contractual clause, otherwise you, you can't rely on it. So you go straight to your contract and see if you've actually got a force majeure clause, uh, clause without kind of betraying anyone's confidence. We're having some issues at the moment with clients who have factories in Italy. Um, they're being closed down, uh, as everyone's aware, and they're frantically pulling up their contracts to have a little look at what the position is. So you have a look and see if there's a force majeure clause. Uh, the standard contracts deal with force majeure quite differently. You've got um, the JCT, which defines force majeure as a delay event, but it doesn't expand on what that term actually means. NEC 4 talks about it as an act of God, um, with a non-exhaustive list of, of what that means. Uh, epidemic is not listed in that. Um, FIDIC lists shortages caused by an epidemic as a delay event entitling a contraction, uh, contracts an extension of time. So the, the key test for me, and this might be the way to tee it up for, for CAT, is whether the standard of proof is met in each case. Um, that, that's the key thing. And at every turn, the contractor will have uh, an obligation to mitigate any losses that they're suffering. Yeah, I think I would I would um, only add to that that dealing with COVID-19, as unsavoury as it is, what I'm about to say, it's going to be a little bit tactical because um, what you're, if you're just looking at delay, you're trying to work out um, which category of delay event, either under a JCT or under a um, NEC, slightly more straightforward because they're dealt with together, but which um, label do you put on it to give you the best chance of getting money back because ultimately getting an extension time obviously protects you from LADs but it's not going to compensate you for being on site longer than um, you would have would otherwise have been um, and the other thing I think to think about is how does the um, how is the effect of 19 being felt is it because it's your supply chain in the way that James has just suggested um, that perhaps you can't get to you the products or the materials that you need to cite um is it that you don't have a labor force that's attending the site because um either government guidelines say that they shouldn't be working um or it might become the case that there is a statutory instrument that comes in because there are provisions in the jct that deal with that um or has the site been shut down by the employer and as a contractor, that would put you in the best position because you're then being prevented from carrying out your works. And more likely than not, you'll find a way of getting time and money. Um, but obviously, as an employer, you're going to wait as long as possible to do that, um, whilst obviously trying to be responsible because um, of the consequences to you of prohibiting people coming to your site. Um, so I don't think, um, I'm sorry, Andy, there's a very straightforward answer to your question as to what what you should put in your notice because it really depends on what effect the um, virus is having on the progress of your works and what clause you're trying to get yourself under in your particular contract but those are the sorts of things i'd be thinking about what are the terms about time what are the times terms about money and what are the terms about variations so that you can um put yourself depending whether you're an employer or a contractor in the best possible position cool Okay, thanks, Kat. So, the next question is one for Bill. Um, so it's about head office overheads. The company may calculate their overhead uplift based on anticipated costs and turnover for the coming year using historic costs as a guide. This calculated percentage would be applied to each project during the tender stage, assuming the contractor hits his target turnover. How has he lost? 
how has he lost money incurred costs if a project overruns unless he can specifically show that he's had to increase head office resources specifically as a result of that overrun? It's quite a long question. Bill, have you got any thoughts on that? Yeah, I've got a very short answer. Um, first of all, good morning, Harvey. Thank you for your question. Uh, the simple answer is that on the case as you've put there, it appears that he hasn't got a loss. Um, so think of such a claim as having two limbs. The second limb is the calculation of how do you calculate the unabsorbed overheads. Um, and the formula method is, is an acceptable method. However, to get to the second limb, you've got to pass the first limb, and that is you've got to prove that you have incurred a loss. And in that, that situation, it appears that you perhaps hasn't incurred a loss. And I think that answers the question. Can I just add um, something in there, Stuart? Okay, anyone else, yeah. Um, if I was being inventive about it, which I sometimes have to be on my cases, I would say, well, the fact that I've achieved my turnover just shows that I was operating more efficiently than I planned. But had I finished this job um, on time, I would then have started another one, and that would have then increased my turnover for the year because I've made my turnover for this job anyway. So it might be that you can find a way of explaining why or how you've suffered a loss. But Bill's absolutely right. If you haven't suffered a loss as a contractor, then there's nothing to claim. Um, but you might want to think um, what would have happened had the project finished on time, what more revenue might you have generated by starting a new project. And obviously that will be subject to proof and showing that there was jobs out there. Um, but if I was trying to put my inventive hat on it and maximise the claim for my client, that's what I'd be thinking of. Obviously, if I was for the employer, I'd say, well, they've, they've not lost anything. <laughs> Depends who's paying me. Cool. OK, next question. Um, uh, Stuart, can I add something? Sorry. Sorry. No, maybe not. Let me go. Yeah, go on. Well, it was only that, you know, I agree with Kat, that's a good point. And that, that would be looking for a, the, upper, the lost opportunity, a bit like a loss of profit claim. So they haven't actually lost anything, but what they have lost is the opportunity to undertake further work in the prolonged period of the original contract. Great. Um, so next question then um, is one for Catherine. Um, how much weight do judges and arbitrators really apply to the delay analysis over the facts? contemporaneous evidence is it largely a matter of fact rather than analysis um, and I guess that, I think that that, all, I mean, yeah I, Tom I think that's right that when you're looking at um at how how credible a delay analysis is um then the reliance on the facts becomes important which is why I've referred to record keeping but without carrying out the analysis to show um how the facts cause delay it's difficult for a judge to just um, take, a, for example, a witness statement or a series of documents and identify what period of delay was caused. So the delay analysis is key, but the the way that delay analysis is put together in its reference to the facts, its reference to the records, will um, then be taken into account by a judge. And you often find it that when you read the judgments and um, the various cases I've referred to are, are a helpful starting point, the judge tends to prefer one analysis over another. So they do take into account the delay analysis. Um, but if it contradicts the facts, or if, for example, I was cross-examining the delay expert um, to show that the facts that it, um, he'd relied on were um, unsupported by contemporaneous documents um, or didn't give rise to the analysis that he was saying, then yes, the, the analysis becomes completely undermined and the judge will go back to the facts. But I think without the analysis bringing it together, um, you, you need both, I think, is the short answer. Great. James, did you have anything to add? Sorry, no, that, uh, I, think that's, um, uh, I think that's very helpful. Cool. OK, one last question I think we'll do. Uh, again, it's aimed at Kat, but it could be any of the, the lawyers or in fact anyone. In. Um, what are the court's views over the use of Emden Hudson or the Aishalay formula in the assessment of head office head office overhead claims. Uh, well, unhelpful answer again from me. It depends how it's done. 
if there's a good justification for using those formula over um, actually providing the underlying figures that would apply to a particular business, um, then the court will be persuaded by that. But if you have the actual numbers, I think the court would prefer to see the numbers and the actual effect on a business or on a contractor uh, rather than just using a formula. But sometimes, particularly for small businesses, they don't exist in a way that you can properly justify an overhead claim and the use of formulas then becomes important. But you need to be able to explain to a judge why you've used them over um, actual records. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So there's nothing wrong with the formulas and, and they are relied on uh, when necessary. But as Kat says, um, that it's a question of fact in each case whether you can otherwise prove the actual loss. Um, so it's not, you know, all all bets are off as soon as we produce that formula. You have to consider it in the round. Cool. Okay, so finally, um, is there a pre prescribed format for giving notices? Um, particularly, I guess, helpful in terms of notices in relation to the, the coronavirus and things. Yeah, that's probably one for me. Is that, um, it, as I was saying in the in my presentation, uh, you've just got to check your contract. The the Construction Act will tell you at um, Section One One Five, I think, from memory. Yeah, you know, Section One One Five. It'll tell you that. Um, Firstly, look at your contract, but if, if for whatever reason the contract doesn't expressly deal with it, then any effective means will suffice. So if you've got a reliable carrier pigeon, for example, that'll do. But if, failing that, what it's saying is if, you, if you're struggling to evidence effective service, you just send it to the registered office um, and that will, that will suffice. Um, but start your contract. Start with your contract, rather, and the standard forms um, if they've been completed properly, or to give you very clear steer on on how you would notice, and, and an associated point that you'll you'll quite often see that comes up is that during the course of the project, somebody's agreed that actually you know no longer send it on pink paper paper to Keith in Swansea, even though that's what the contract says. It's all right for you to email it to Dave over in this site here, um, and you've got to be very very careful. About because if, if your contract is very clear, for example, it might have been executed as a deed, and it might make it abundantly clear that the notice does have to go on pink paper to keep in Swansea, then there's a very strong legal argument to say that some email from Dave saying send it to me probably isn't effective because any variation to that deed would also have to be by deed. So you have to be very, very careful about your contracts, and in particular, any any kind of request that comes in to change that approach, especially when you could have these condition precedents lurking in the contract saying if you don't do it a set way, you forego your right to claim. Okay. Any other comments from any of the speakers before we uh, wrap up? No, I don't think so. No. No, good. no, just to thank you, Stuart and, and Annie in particular for your perseverance, especially with me, uh, getting me online <laughs> today. So that was no mean feat. Thank you very, very much. No, thank you. Uh, I say it's, it's quite um, an achievement because we, I say, we've never done this before with Decipher. We're not particularly familiar with the webinar systems and how they work. So this was one that we found that we thought ought to work, and it seems to have done quite well. Thank you to everyone who's attended. Um, particular thanks, as I say, to the speakers for for agreeing to to try this out and uh, seeing if it works, and it seems to work. So this could be the new normal. So. Um, and if you do have any questions, by all means, email me or any of the team. We're quite happy to um, answer any questions offline when you when you've had a think about things that we've spoken about this morning. We have been recording the webinar, so if the speakers are happy, I'll make sure afterwards that we make this available. Um, but otherwise, thank you and enjoy the rest of your day. I hope you manage to uh, get through the next few weeks.